Good evening, I'm Aram Collier. I'm the head of programming for Real Asian. Thank you for joining us for our post-screening panel for Down a Dark Stairwell. This screening of the film and the discussion with tonight's guests are made possible by the CBC. And we'll start the discussion in just a moment. If you're watching live from CineSend and you wanna ask our guests questions, use the Ask a Question interface or continue the conversation by going to our Real Asian Film Forum at realasian.com slash film forum. All comments and discussions are subject to our code of conduct, realasian.com code of conduct. We recognize that the content of this film might be triggering to those who have been impacted by traumatic anti-Black violence. We have engaged the services of an active listener to support this programming, and you can reach them at realasian.com slash active listener. So we have a lot to discuss about this film, so I'd like to welcome our moderator, Natalia Hunter-Young. Thanks, Ram. Good evening. My name is Natalia Hunter-Young, and I will be your moderator for tonight's post-screening panel discussion with the makers of the film you hopefully just watched, Down a Dark Stairwell, as well as artist and activist Cyrus Marcus Ware. I'm joining you from Tecoronto, where I live, labor, study, and struggle on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Tonight, I would like to start by honoring the life of a Kai girly, a son, father, partner, friend, and nephew remembered by his aunt as a peacemaker. That is to say that the world is less peaceful without him. Today is also Akai's birthday. I invite you to hold Akai's memory with peace throughout this discussion and in the days and years that follow. I also invite you to send peaceful thoughts to his family and to all who loved him. Before I introduce our panelists, I wanna share that after I watched the film, I was reminded of Edmund Wai Hong Yu, a mad Hong Kong Canadian former medical student who was shot and killed by the Toronto Police Service on February 20th, 1997. I want to honor Edmund Yu's life as well and the struggle for justice that followed, not in an effort to demonstrate that police kill Asian people too, but because as a student of history, it is an example that I have, that my elders have shared with me, of coalition building that we cannot afford to forget. On the poster you're looking at, advertising a protest in honor of Yu's life, there are 38 local cultural organizations listed in alphabetical order as endorsers. They include the 519, Aboriginal Legal Services, Across Boundaries Ethno-Racial Mental Health Center, African Canadian Legal Clinic, African Resource Center, Anti-Racist Action, Association of Chinese Canadian Social Scientists, Black Action Defense Committee, Canadian Union of Public Employees, Ontario Division, Chinese Canadian National Council, Chinese Interagency Network, Jamaican Canadian Association, Medenta. These are just some of the 38 organizations listed. I invite you to hold on to this example of struggle across communities as knowledge we still have, and as an example of organizing we still can use this year and in the years that follow. All right, let's meet the panelists. Ursula Liang is a journalist turned filmmaker. After working in print, she directed two critically acclaimed feature documentaries, Nine Man and Down a Dark Stairwell. Ursula lives in, Bro in, the, in Bronx, New York. Jason M. Harper is a documentarian. Down a Dark Stairwell is his third documentary feature as editor. He's currently editing a feature documentary about Kanye West. His work has been featured on Adweek, Vimeo Staff Fix, Vader, and the Guggenheim. Michelle Chang is a Brooklyn-based editor of documentary features as well as a short form of, sorry, as well as of short form projects. Feature credits include When Claude Got Shot, Harbor from the Holocaust, Nine Men, Like Any Other Kid, Asexual, and the Emmy-nominated American Promise. Before becoming an editor, Michelle was an associate producer for ABC News, 2020, and Primetime. And Cyrus Marcus Ware 
is a Banyé scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks in Black activist culture. He is part of the Performance Disability Art Collective and a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. And Ursula, Michelle, and Jason, congratulations on the film. Um, Ursula, maybe you can start and just share how the project came to be um, and why you decided to make this film. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for leading off the conversation. Um, I actually heard about the case like most people did in the news. I read about it and this was about four months after the Eric Garner case in New York, which you know I'm very close to being uh, you know, a few boroughs away from that. Um, and uh, about four months uh, uh, from that case, uh, this case popped up and the headlines um, included somebody with my last name. Um, so I was definitely paying attention to it. Um, I am not related to the officer, but um, uh, my brother, his name is actually Peter too. So it was one of those things that just really like popped onto my screen and, and stuck there. Um, but beyond the name, I sort of knew that this added a new wrinkle to the conversation, um, that it was an Asian American officer that was involved. And I think like a lot of people who have a uh, little representation in the media when something happens in the media and, and the person that represent your culture is is on sort of like the bad side, you, you has like huge cringe. Um, so I was really keyed into it right away. And it, and it felt like an opportunity to tell a story that we don't get to see that often. Most um, stories about race are seen in this like, you know, black, white binary or an Asian white binary, everything's sort of compared to whiteness. And so to explore a story that had, um, you know, people of color at its core was really interesting to me. Thanks. Jason and Michelle, um, how did you come to be involved in the project and what was important for you um, to bring to bring to it? You want to go first, Michelle? Okay. Um, so I was the like first editor on the film. Um, I edited Nine Man with Nurse Ursula, so we already knew each other, you know, really well. Um, I'd also kind of helped do like a fundraising trailer, so I was already familiar with the project. So, um, so yeah, we we edited, you know, like for a few months together and um, brought it to a certain place, and then there was a sort of a break, and then later um, Jason came on, and so I wasn't editing; we weren't editing at the same time. And then I sort of came back around like at the very end, I kind of stayed connected to it and was like watching cuts. And then I came back around at the very end to do some finishing stuff. So that's how I became involved. And I met Ursula um, after a screening of um, the last feature I did at Tribeca. Um, and she came up afterwards. It had to, to do with, uh, um, it was a documentary about Stefan Marbury, who's an NBA player who ended up in China. And so there was a kind of mingling of black and, and Chinese issues. And I think that kind of sparked for Ursula the, the idea that that was a good an intersection that I, I was familiar with. And um, Michelle had brought the doc to a great point. And so I was fortunate to be able to, to carry it from where it was to, um, uh, to where it ended up. And uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot about the Asian American community, which I've lived in, I've been living in, in Brooklyn for 10 years. And there is not a lot of interaction between the, the African American and Asian American community here, um, probably more so in the city um, or in, in Queens, um, where they're kind of proper Chinatowns. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really interesting. And, and um, I think between Michelle and I, we were able to, to sort of make sure that there was equity and representation for for both sides, hopefully. What well, what were the two of you kind of looking to to see the project um, embody? Um, for for me, um, uh, as a black man in America, I wanted to make sure that um, once I became sort of more familiar with the story, that Akai's side was sort of fairly represented. Um, and uh, my life's work in general in film is is fully dedicated to making sure that that blacks are represented in a way that um, is, is maybe unexpected or non-traditional. Um, and unfortunately, in a case like this, that just means making sure that our lives have have meaning and have have um, uh, are portrayed as lives with value, um, which was. Uh, uh, 
you know, difficult in a, in a, in a case like this. Um, I just watched the film again uh, today and realized just how contentious it was. And, and um, I hadn't watched it in a while and just a lot of emotions were, were welling up about it um, to see. Yeah. Having, having um, the black community represented in a, in a, in a fair and equitable way and to try to make sure that voice was heard um, was something that, that uh, um, I was trying to be very deliberate about. Um, but Ursula was always a guiding hand in that and making sure that there was uh, sort of a temperature check about um, like tr true, I don't know if you'd call it neutrality, but certainly it leaves the viewer to make a decision for themselves about um, ultimately what you draw from the story, I think. Michelle, did you want to add? Sure. Um, I think for me, what struck me initially about the project, I mean, I think even though, um, you know, Akai Gurley being killed at the hands of Peter Liang, um, you know, a New York City police officer, is the, you know, the incident that incites this whole story, and it's at the heart of the story. Um, in some ways, it's not, you know, the most compelling part of the story. It really begins with, you um, the massive protest that happens um, on the, the Chinese American side was sort of the thing that jumped out um, as the most compelling thing because it was so kind of unusual. And unfortunately, um, you know, a Kai girly getting killed by a police officer at that time, it was like another in a line of, of these things that were so terrible. But in a way that wasn't you know, unfortunately the unusual part, it was like the reaction that was like, wait, like what is going on here? Um, and, you know, and it was the first thing, it was like kind of the first thing Ursula shot, you know, in terms of, of covering the story. So it's kind of where the footage began and where, you know, it's sort of the entry point into the storytelling in this film um, was. And then we had to go back and sort of, you know, retell the incident and all the stuff that kind of led up to that. But to first see, you know, the footage of that protest and all these kind of like weird, you know, semiotics going on, like all the, you know, American dream, like patriotism stuff and kind of like appropriating civil rights language. And then like, you know, using all the same language and like rhetoric that you would see in like Black Lives Matter protests or like this idea of justice, especially which is kind of at the heart of the film and these like kind of dueling ideas of justice that end up, you know, that people can be kind of chanting the same thing and be after like completely different ends and how these kind of things just ended up colliding and intersecting in this weird way because of this really like unique case. Um, so kind of um, teasing that out, like this idea of justice, I think that was like a big thing for me. Cyrus, um, can you speak to just like what came through for you as you watched uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, uh, you know, I rewatched the film again tonight, and so um, I'm hot. I'm piping hot. You know, I'm uh, feeling the you know intensity of what it means to uh, witness another case of police brutality, another case of police violence, another case where there's a lack of accountability, another case where black people are told it's too dark to see them. Another situation where once again, we are um, brutalized with very little accountability. One of the things that strikes me is the time that this happened. So the film really documents a moment in both um, the organizing for the East Asian communities in support of Akai, the organizing of the East Asian community in support of Officer Liang, and then of course the organizing within the movement for Black Lives around Akai Gurley's case. And you see a snapshot into organizing in 2016 or 2015 or whenever it was, you know? And that to me is fascinating as an archive to think about what it was looking like in that moment, especially looking back at that in 2020. Right. And what would the conversation look like in this moment in 2020 when everyone is saying it's time to defund the police, it's time to turn to abolition, that perhaps the chant isn't indict, convict, send the killer cop to jail, 
but rather the criminal justice system has nothing to do with justice and that our justice and accountability is going to come from a different source than the court system. You know, we just had the case of Defonte Miller uh, in Takaranto where, you know, he was beaten within an inch of his life by the police and nothing happened. You know, the cops were acquitted. So we know that the, 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 you know, the conversation right now is justice is never going to come from the state. The police are always going to protect their own. We know this, we've been saying this, but now there's finally a, a broader conversation about that. So to me, it's a very interesting um, <clears throat> thing to be watching this film in 2020 and wondering what would the protests be like and what would the calls for accountability be like if this were happening right now? You know, and I just have some questions about that. So anyways, it's fascinating to me uh, to, we rarely get to see what the behind the scenes of activism looks like. And I think that you've captured, you know, some of the tensions in a, in a really interesting way, so. Jason, you mentioned neutrality. And I, I think that's like an interesting point to pick up on. The filmmaking legacy that we've all kind of inherited is one that I think would suggest that the camera is somehow a neutral, tool, but we all know, of course, that that, you know, is far from reality. And, um, and in this instance where you're trying to sort through kind of what appears to be two sides um, of this conflict, those seeking justice for Akai, right, this idea of what what is justice that we will keep talking about, um, and then those seeking an acquittal for Peter Liang, you know, what discussions did you all have, Ursula, Jason, Michelle, um, about the kind of myth of neutrality and that, you know, what or how you um, will, will position, you know, the kind of perspective in the film. And Ursula, why don't you go ahead, yeah. Well, I think we always knew that to balance the film in some way, it wouldn't actually be 50-50 situation. Um, it was kind of interesting because as we were editing, as, as you guys have watched the film, there's obviously some Asian Americans that were really strongly in support of the Akai Gurley um, point of view. And the more that sort of perspective uh, grew with testing audiences, sometimes there were so many Asian faces on screen, even though they were saying the same things that the Black folks were saying, that that became like uh, an issue for people who watched it. They were uncomfortable with the, the they felt like, you know, they, the balance was really off. And so there was like, a, you know, balancing had a lot to do with like, uh, emotion and content more than it did with uh, sort of like an actual equality of footage. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I became a journalist at first because I understood that there's like really no such thing as neutrality and that I really wanted to be the person that saw things with my own eyes and didn't have that filter between me and what was happening. And so that was one of the gifts that I sort of wanted to give myself. But I, I think, you know, you're we're keenly aware that anything that we do and as hard as we tried in the edit to accomplish certain things, um, the way things are received on the other end is also affected by the life perspective that everybody comes um, to a screening with. Um, so, I mean, you know, we tried to be very um, transparent with the subjects um, and always made it clear that we were talking to multiple sides. I think one of the things that's happened in the media these days is is it's gone beyond people questioning whether, you know, things are neutral to people knowing or expecting things to be unneutral. So, you know, we're in this, you guys, I don't know if you have the same thing or know what we're dealing with in the US, but you know, the whole Fox News versus New York Times kind of thing in, um, in New York, um, you know, people even in the documentary space are expecting to have an advocacy film now that follows like one point of view. And so um, I really acknowledge that the subjects had a lot of trouble understanding that it wasn't going to be like a, like a clear advocacy film that followed just like one person on one side of the story um, and and spoke sort of towards like what they were wanting to hear. And I and it's just not the type of film I wanted to make because I specifically because it was two communities of color that I wanted to honor and like center their their points of view, even if I didn't agree with them, even if people weren't going to agree with them. But I do, you know, I really appreciate that Cyrus um, sees this as sort of like a document and, and it takes so long to make these films that you're kind of stressing out about them while you're making them. Cause it's like, I really wish this was out two years ago when this was happening. And, um, and now it's a long time ago. And I think back at this, you know, the incident happened six years ago. The, the most of what we filmed was four years ago. And, um, um, but it also, you know, we knew when we were making it that we needed to even contextualize things. We were going to need to contextualize things for the future. So to to make sure that people knew that Eric Garner was killed four months beforehand was very important because that affects how all the subjects in the film acted. And um, so anyway, I mean, the it, it, neutrality is sort of like, you know, an impossible goal. And I don't 
expect people to think the film was entirely neutral or um, or or even approach the film with any kind of neutrality. But you know, I think what we wanted to do is, and what we try to do with films, where you know we're filming hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage that you distill into like an hour and a half, and we tried to like represent people authentically and that's sort of like the base that we could do it's like you know you've interviewed somebody for an hour and you can only use three of their bites it's like is this does this represent them well does this distort what they were trying to say and so you know we people don't know how long it takes to edit a film you have two people here and they didn't just spend like a week on it we spent like oh you know a, a close to a year i don't even know i've lost track editing the film and so that's why it takes so long to get out to but we you know the, Jason and Michelle and I have had like, you know, hour, two hour, three hour long conversations about one line and that's how it goes. So we did our, we did our best. Um, but I guess that's a long way to say that, you know, there's no way to, there's no way to accomplish neutrality. There's no way to really promise it. And we just do our best to be fair. Yeah. I mean, from, did, among those conversations, was there was there like you know I hope that the audience takes away this thing or that they, yeah. that they with the subjects. I mean, when I talk to the subjects, I always ask them what they wanted to, why they wanted to participate in the film, or what they would want the film to say. And you know, you can't promise any, but you can't if you're going in journalistically, you can't promise anyone that you're going to be their mouthpiece. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people on the Kai side were like, you know, Kai's case is not getting a lot of like. Uh, burn, you know what I mean? It's just like people don't know about this case. And I think because it was such a complicated case, um, some of the activists didn't latch onto it in the same way nationally, but they wanted his name to be remembered. And the fact that you start off the evening like remembering Akai is accomplishing something that they wanted when they participated in the film. And so, um, you know, I, I knew when they said something like that, that we could we could definitely give them that. And, you know, I mean, there have been some criticisms about the film about not having more scenes of the Asian American activists who are um, uh, protesting on behalf of Akai. But when I spoke to that, um, that one organizer, she said that she was almost, she almost didn't want to do the interview because for her, she didn't, you know, their movement as Asian organizers in this movement was to take a side role and they didn't want to like eclipse or, um, or take time, screen time away from the black activists. So that was like, a, that was a specific thing that she, you know, that was part of her hesitation in participating with the film. And so I understood that as well. And so they, they gave us less access, but it was also, you know, we understood that. And it was part of our goal too, to like elevate the black voices in the film. And, and you know, and even in the fact that um, a lot of the organizers, by the time we started filming had, you know, had sort of fallen off and not, we're not doing as much organizing. We wanted to make sure there were like black male voices. And a lot of the organizers at that time were black females. And so we made an effort to include some of those street scenes so we could really hear, um, you know, we could, the people that were not actively involved in the case also became a part of the conversation that, that um, you know, the audiences would see. Okay. I mean, Cyrus, you brought up this year, um, which has brought a ton of devastation and a ton more anti-Black police violence, um, but it has also brought with it um, the take up of discussions around abolition in a way that has been, you know, not seen before in this in this time. Um, and in particular, um, many are learning that abolishing the police, you know, the only thing that would actually put an end to police violence also means abolishing prisons as institutions that rely, you know, they, the policing and prisons rely on each other um, as well as many other institutions. And so um, so here we have this case where we have a police officer who has taken someone's life for walking up the stairs, right? And, um, and after realizing what he had done, Peter Liang still did not administer CPR, right? No officer present tried to save Akai's life. So, so we want justice and accountability for that. But then we know that prisons don't mean justice for anyone. You know what, Cyrus? What does consequence, as opposed to punishment, begin to look like here? That's a that's a tough question, Cyrus. Go for it. <laughs> well, this is the thing, right? Okay, so there's several things that we see in this film, right? We see like these questions that come up. Why didn't they do CPR? Why didn't they do anything? The neighbor says, "Quote: There's a million cops in the hallway." Right? Why didn't that, and then were you trained in CPR? Yes, they, and so there's two things that are problematic with his answer. Yes, he's trained, and two, they gave us the answers for the test. 
Great job, cops. You're really showing us what you're spending this billions of dollars a year on, right? Like once again, like you're just such a corrupt, such a depleted, such a morally bankrupt organization in so many ways, right? So anyways, this film, you know, tries to portray this one officer in this way that, I'm sorry, not the film, the activist, uh, the main activist in uh, uh, in support of the officer tries to portray uh, the the cop in this way that we know, this this not all co- not all cops, right? So like, you know, I know that, that I've been beaten up by a cop too and cops, some cops are bad, but not, not this, this is, an, you know, so this idea always, whenever there is a, a, a fatality at the hands of the police is that it's an exception. You know that this is an exceptional case. This is a once in a blue moon when it's not. They are killing us every single month. We're hearing a story about somebody who has died at the hands of the police in the states. Just and literally, as you say in the case of a Kai Gurley, no media attention whatsoever in the states. Just last month, they shot two people in the, while they were sitting in the car in front of their parents' house. They shot them. They shot them in the car. One of them died. The other one didn't. Nobody's even talking about it. Like, I, I, I can't even tell you their names. Like, it is so common and so prevalent. So what does accountability look like? Well, we know that accountability is never going to come from the hands of the state. The special investigations units that investigate in cases where there has been a police officer discharging their weapon and where there has been a fatality, they always rule in favor of the cops because they are they are ex-cops. They're retired police officers who make up these civilian accountability forces. So we know that justice is not going to come through the state uh, systems of carceral, of carceral logics, right? We have to start to try to dismantle the cop that is in our in our minds and in our bodies. We have to start to think about what would healing look like for that community? What would justice look like for that community? You know, we know that the police and the prison system were predicated on this idea that to be black is to be a danger to society and therefore a need to be eradicated, right? This is why they're patrolling those stairwells in the first place. This is why they're patrolling a mostly black and racialized working class and street involved community and they're patrolling there already in the first place. They're already targeted policing this community, right? So what does accountability look like? Well, it looks like so many different things. You know, accountability looks like defunding the police. Accountability looks like reinvesting that money into the community so that the community has everything that they need so that they actually have stairwells that are lit. You know, re- accountability looks like reinvesting into the community to ensure that this never, ever ever happens again. It doesn't necessarily mean that we punish one particular person, rather we abolish the system that would allow the conditions for this to happen over and over and over again. To me, that's what an accountability would look like. Thanks. I I, I, I have to agree. I have to, like, I, thinking to hear that, um, Ursula, to hear you say that, the, that Akai's um, family and the activists that were present really just wanted his name to be known and to think that like, you know, I mean, what what are we left with? You know what I mean? It's that like that we are so completely all the time inundated with anti-Black uh, violence from the state that, you know, justice is such like, an, it's such an empty concept, right? We have, there's nothing that um, that we can hope for other than you know name recognition and that like we have to have more there has to be something more that can be asked of of you know the world that we live in you know it has to be it has to be more than like than just remembering our names and so thank you for that cyrus because i have to i I have to i have to wonder like when when do we have this opportunity to re to to renegotiate the terms of justice. Like when when does justice actually get to mean something for black people um, and for black lives, right? Um, so I wanna kind of shift gears and move to kind of this question of repair um, and thinking about, you know, where we are now um, in 2020, which is like the, the conversation, at least many more people are, um, are wanting to to think about and talk about alternatives to policing um, and other ways other ways of being with each other in the world. And what does repair start to look like in this type of situation? Maybe 
um, Ursula, Jason, and Michelle, some, uh, either of you can talk about kind of what has happened since this incident in um, in New York. What what has has there been um, have there have there been efforts at repair? Because when I watch the film, I just there's so much hurt. You know, yeah. there's so much hurt that I am, um, and, and so much harm that is happening just in those protests, in those spaces, as people argue for this police officer who did this, who killed this human, this person. Um, well, I mean, to answer your question related to the case, um, all that emotion is still quite strong and there hasn't been specific repair between the communities that were um, participating, that are in the film. Um, there was, you know, on an individual level, Peter and Akai's um, domestic partner had a meeting, um, which um, according to her, um, she, you know, Kai's um, domestic partner has a lot of like uh, open, you know, she's very open-minded and she had a lot of, I don't know if she had a lot of forgiveness, but she genuinely felt like his uh, emotion when they met. Um, there, you know, these, you know, in terms of the specific other characters in the film or other subjects in the film, like they didn't, you know, when we were conceptualizing that this film would come out at a film festival live in person, they didn't even want to be in the same room. They were still at a place where they couldn't, they were like, you need to have separate screenings for us because if I see this person. Um, and um, and so that was where things were. You know, I think the pandemic kind of like made everything go a little wild. And then we had this sort of new uprising of a new, um, you know, a new surge of activism around the George Floyd case and Maude Arbery and Breonna Taylor. And, um, and it was interesting to watch just like from a distance. I'm not like in physical contact with anybody, but I am in sort of all these social media circles that are like a very large diversity of Asian people. Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was, it was, I think um, it made me feel a little optimistic to see like some of the folks that were really more on the conservative side of the issue really, um, understanding that movement. So this new movement for black lives was something that was like very, was 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 a very, was very clear cut to them. And so folks that I think you would have thought you saw in this film were also like very much in support of this, this summer's movement. So that was interesting to see um, in terms of like, you know, I think that one thing that we wanted to do with the film is like really shake people up a little bit. Um, we definitely did not want to like demonize the whole Asian American community. Um, I think, Part of what motivated so many Asian people to, to rally behind um, Peter was this feeling of like never having an opportunity to express their personal trauma because it, it you know, in so many ways, there's always a trauma that's larger. And so um, the feeling of, not, you know, not having a justice system that works for them in many other ways and not having, a, you know, police system that worked for them either and not having and not having a voice like publicly, I think was was part of like the motivation for needing to be heard in some way. And it, it happened that they were, were able to like mobilize behind this very controversial case. But, um, you know, I think it's uh, at the same time, there were a lot of people who had been working in solidarity, you know, since since the beginning, a lot of Asian Americans have been working in various forms of solidarity, Asian American Black Panthers, et cetera, et cetera, um, who wanted to, um, who sort of, were alone in their activism in some ways. The larger Asian American community wasn't very active. Um, and this moment, seeing like a large swell of activism in a space that they didn't, you know, that didn't fit their progressive values was was like a big wake up call. So I think there's a lot of um, movement from sort of the more active activist organizer, Asian Americans, younger folks to, um, to think about why this case like inspired so many people to support um, the Peter Liang side. Um, I've seen like research being done now on things like that they're calling the Chinese Tea Party and sort of the rise of conservatism and the rise of um, all these forces that are trying to um, build wedges, you know, use wedges to divide people and um, and truly really to think more about the systemic stuff that is like and who's benefiting from our communities not being aligned. And so I think you know, it's it. You know, I think those folks became very motivated um, in the wake of this case, um, where they were sort of in their lane doing their own thing, and now they're realizing that they have a particular ability to speak to and communicate with um, a larger majority that now is starting to be activated. Are you seeing any reflection at all, though, on that time and on the case with Akai? Because you know, certainly, I understand um, the point of view that you're sharing, but I I, I also wonder. 
um, because as I watched, it was very clear that what they what the protesters were arguing was was for a level of impunity that white people and white cops have been afforded. Um, that that you know had it was this if Peter Liang was white, he wouldn't have been. Uh, charged, right? He yeah, I, I mean, I think that a lot of people would agree with that um, statement, but I also don't think that that's what a lot of those folks were arguing. And maybe Michelle and Jason can chime in. I think they really, you know, I think that it was more along the lines of what Cyrus was saying, which is it's, this is sort of an exceptional case where um, they really saw the facts as being accidental and they really saw um, this as being, you know, that by and large, this was sort of an A plus cop otherwise. It wasn't like a guy like uh, in the George Floyd case who had had years and years of uh, com civilian complaints against them. Um, maybe Jason and Michelle want to weigh in on that a little bit. Um, I, I'm not sure if this answers the, the question exactly, but one thing that stuck out to me as I did this watch down was one of my favorite conversations, which happens on the sideline of the, um, of the large uh, protests that happens and you have um, Hortensia auntie uh, kind of try to enter the crowd and then they sort of end up on the sidelines and then there's this very interesting conversation that happens between um, two very articulate people from both sides um, black and Asian American uh, and there's uh, something interesting that, that the black woman says which is that the verdict does not appease the black community um, it does not appease us to um, to receive uh, for for Peter to um, re to be convicted of the crime that he did. It's what we expect, but it it does not equate to justice, and it does not um, it does not uh, appease the community. It doesn't. It, there's the wrinkle is still there. Um, so it's almost as if the um, when when something in the justice system happens, it happens because it's expected but the repercussions of it aren't necessarily felt as a matter of fact, sometimes it has the opposite effect. Um, so uh, in terms of what the activists want, it's not, uh, although it's shouted that, you know, um, uh, that the Kai Gurley um, protester, protesters wanted to see a verdict and a conviction and a sentence that was actual because that's what's supposed to be expected from the system. Um, I think, Ultimately, um, what they were after was something, as Cyrus said, is something that the system is ill-equipped to provide, um, which is, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say that what you see there is the same system. And, and um, for example, American military strength when we're uh, fighting a war in, in sort of fill-in-the-blank country and collateral damage happens in the same way that it does with the NYPD and the pink houses. Um, what do we do? We take money and we pay that to the to the families of those who have been killed accidentally. And we say, here's what you get in exchange for the life that we took. Um, and that trade is the same thing that we see happen um, with the Kai's family. Um, does that satisfy the situation, you know, for, for a, such a payout to have happened? Um, does it appease us? No. Uh, uh, is it what is expected? Yes. And so I, I think it's a it's a complicated it's a complicated question to to ask what we actually want from an event like this, except for systemic change. Um, and at a time at the time that that um, these protests were happening, I don't even know if we had the um, I don't know if these protests were the organizers organizers there had the same kind of syntax that that protests in 2020 have mm -hmm. where you can use language like defund the police and that can spark a reaction and get people to actually say well what do you actually mean by that and the reallocation of resources and um uh we didn't we didn't see that language in, in those protests back then i'm sure it existed but it wasn't to the level um that it is that it has been this year um, had we been using that language earlier, perhaps there would have been more progress, but it's sort of better late than never. So yeah, it's a very tough question to ask. Um, well, Jason uh, brings up a really good point um, when he talks about sort of those two organizers or those two people on the sideline being articulate. And he brings up another point about language. And I think that's one of the things that we wanted to show non-Asian audiences when making the film. Um, Michelle and I, you know, really saw it in the footage that 
this is, you know, we are still Asian American community in New York is has a lot of um, low English proficiency members. And so um, we're also we also like really discovered in reporting out the film that a lot of these folks were getting their news from, you know, social and and Asian language sources. So some of the things that we can assume um, in our, you know, English speaking woke kind of community that people know are not things that they knew. Like there were a lot of those folks that had not heard about the other Black Lives Matter cases because they weren't reported in the Chinese newspapers. And the Chinese newspapers didn't report them until it was um, a member of the Asian community that was involved. And so, you know, one of the things that's happening in this country to all of our communities is that we're really like focused, we're, we're so like, um, you know, culturally, interculturally focused that we're not that we're thinking about our communities and understanding our communities in a different way than we are understanding the communities outside. And so that was something that we thought was important um, to know about this this the you know this New York City like space is that we're all like really we're all really still segregated. And so this community is not only physically segregated into Chinatowns that you know were a were the result of like racist legislation of multiple generations ago, but they. Um, but they're also um, linguistically isolated. And so that does like create a, a, an issue. And one of the things that I think is important to think about when watching the film and thinking about how we move forward is how we use language. Um, you know, we've gotten these movements to like have a lot of like lingo that makes sense to a lot of us, defund the police, uh, systemic racism. These are really big concepts to folks who don't have the language and don't have the cultural um, foundation in American values. So. Um, you know, not, you know, not to like uh, perpetual foreignize like the entire community, because I feel like that's another problem we have. But but you can see in the film, there are a lot of these folks that have, you know, accents and are coming and look like more recent immigrants. And so one of the things I think is important for us to think as 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 we like work towards more solidarity movements is is whether we can meet people a little bit closer to where they are. Um, I think it's gotten to the point where we've become so familiar with the demands that we're making that, you know, should be met, but they're not the concepts are not necessarily translating to people that are that are further away from from the movement. So, um, so I think you know that's where you know sometimes we would laugh in the edit. Me and Michelle, we would see like you know the you know a large protests in the Asian American community, and they're really you know it's it's sort of like the birth of a new protest movement, and they only really had one or two cheers. And so poor Michelle is trying to like cut something together with a little variety, and it's the same cheer over and over again. Whereas you have the Akai side, and there is like this long legacy of like singing and chants and like everything's new and inventive. And you can just like sort of see that. And and so it was interesting for us. I didn't mean to say we were laughing at the, the Asian American protesters, but you know, at the end we had a little scene at, at some point that we cut out where there's, you know, after that big thousand, you know, thousand person protest, they're going around like with trash bags and picking up all the trash and trying to be good citizens. So like culturally the, the approach to the organizing was very new and very different. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, if you watch the film for the fourth time or fifth time, you'll start to see some of those things. Um, and, and you know, I think it's really hard for me as a director to be in a position of explaining um, the point of views in the film that exists that are a little hard, you know, a little hard to, for me as a, you know, from my point of view to explain, but, um, but I think that there's some, there's some space and some part of me that wanted people just to like feel a little bit what, you know, not, not necessarily like, parse to the argument so much and like, uh, but but sort of feel where some of the motivation is coming from. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it totally does. Um, and I appreciate that. I think that what you've also shown in the film is like um, uh, in a bit in terms of what you're talking about too, uh, just the stark kind of uh, differences in folks who who are um, like this, the kind of internal fracture that you saw, that you saw, right? And so the folks who are kind of connected um, with the kind of present discourse, um, and then the folks um, who, like you're talking about, who are generally older folks who are far, a bit more removed. Um, but I also like, and, and I certainly don't want to put you in a position to try and explain for the subjects who are in the film, but I do want to, like, it is interesting for me to think about what kind of learning can come from the film and what um, has come since the film is made, because it's been a few years since the moments and the, the years that are captured in, in the film. Um, and so, like thinking with, uh, like you mentioned what you were hoping non-Asian audiences would take away and like how they would be able to kind of um, see some of the nuanced elements that you're speaking to. But I also wonder what you were hoping Asian communities would take away from 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 this film. Because um, I, I think, you know, as one example, and we're thinking about tools and, and, and things going forward, because as you mentioned, the black history, is a, the black community has a long history 
um, of struggle because there's a long history of violence. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, none of this is new, right? And so it's it's unfortunate that folks are weren't aware and it wasn't being reported in, in and amongst the Asian community um, until until uh, there was a di that direct connection. And so you know we see all that resourcing support that is that is put towards the money that is put towards Peter Liang's case. And I wonder, like, you know, is there conversation happening around what that money could have done for a Kai's family, or you know how that how we support you know, the, the victim, the actual victim in this situation, because someone lost their life, right? And so I wonder, have you seen that kind of discussion being taken up um, among them? Um, I do know on small levels, there were a lot of things done to help Akai's family. And of course, that was from the, um, the community of folks that, on the Asian side that were already aligned. So, you know, I know that, you know, they helped throw parties for the kids and, uh, you know, catered some events. And so there were some, you know, in reality, there were some financial resources going towards the family. Um, but, you know, um, you know, I don't think that there's, I don't think the case has become a rallying point for anything really large, um, you know, as big as the movement and arguing it out was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I forgot the first part of your question. No, uh, it was <laughs> You've answered it. Yeah, it was whether whether there's been um, anything that's come come from it in, in that place. Maybe a last question before we go to the audience. Um, uh, Cyrus, where where do we go from here? And like from the end of this, um, the, the end of the time that's captured in the film, but also from the end of 2020. We are at the end of 2020. Where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think so much about this idea of transformative justice and what it offers for us, right? It suggests that what we're doing is not repairing harm or restoring harm, but rather we're transforming the entire conditions that created the existence of harm in the first place. So we would necessarily be dismantling the white supremacy that was at play largely in all areas of this case. The white supremacy that would have led to the targeted policing of Akai's building. The white supremacy that probably, yes, did lead to them being more harsh with Peter Liang when it came to sentencing. The white, the white supremacy that was laced through all of this, right? So we'd be trans radically transforming the conditions. Where are we now? Trans 2020 is a period of collapse. Our society is going through a period of collapse. Capitalism is, is failing and dying. Um, you know, the, the, the state is kind of flailing its limbs and trying to steady a boat that is already capsizing, right? We are, we, are, we are in the middle of a transition into something different, which means that it is fertile ground for planting the possibilities of abolition. We can resolve our issues with conflict, crisis, and harm without policing and without prison. We can keep our communities safe without police officers with their guns walking up and down stairwells. We can take care of each other in ways that mean that in fact, all of our communities can be aligned together to work towards the ultimate goal of the self-determination of all of our people, right? We actually can do all of these things in our lifetime. We have survived before policing. We will survive again after policing. Policing are not keeping our communities safer or more secure. They just are not. They're not. It is happening too often that they are so afraid of blackness, of madness, of disability, of poor people, of drug users, that the immediate reaction is to fire and discharge their weapons. It doesn't matter how much training they've had. It doesn't matter any, it doesn't matter anything else. We're pumping millions and millions of dollars into this police for these police forces and they're brutalizing us and they're killing us. So no, no more. 2020 in the period of collapse as capitalism dies, as we go into something different, we need to say, we will take over from here. We got this. We will take care of each other. We will keep our community safer and more secure. We will make sure that everybody has what they need in order to survive so that the conditions that would have initially created the harm are not there. This is the moment that we are in. We are on the precipice of a new day and it feels awful because change is hard and transitions are difficult and the dying uh, system is not gonna go without a fight. 
I mean, look at what's happening in the States, right? So we know that this is going to be a difficult transition, but we are about to get so much freer. So 2020 may be difficult, but it's because it's a period of collapse, but it's also the period of birthing. It's the birthing of a new world, a world without police, a world without police violence, a world where Black people will be able to walk in the dark, where we will be able to walk in the dark. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's go to the audience. Um, so we have a question here for the directors and the editors. All of you spoke to trying to present a neutral perspective. I don't know that you said that. I think we talked a bit about that, but I'll keep reading. Um, to the most extent possible. If you were, take, uh, were to take an editorial stance on the subject, what would each of yours be? You've already spoken to this, but I wonder if there's more that you want to say kind of to, to the, to the perspective or to how you how you came to the film. And what you I've now remembered the question you asked me before that I forgot to answer. So I could answer that. You were asking me what I what did I want Asian audiences to learn? Yeah. Um, you know, we definitely were, you know, all three of us were trying to build the film thinking. We always think about, you know, who the audience is and some and we know that the audience for us, we wanted it to be black and Asian people, but we also knew there were going to be others watching. So we always thought about how those groups would all be perceiving the film. And one of the things I hoped um, that we did a lot of was trying to do um, not um, comparing, but sort of like paralleling on the communities and, you know, knowing that a lot of the Asian, some of the Asian audiences would be less informed on some of these movements and, and have a lot less contact with um, the black community. We wanted to make sure that, that we were showing parallels. So there, you know, there are even interstitial moments where people are just like walking up and down stairs, like, you know, where black folks are like hauling boxes up store, you know, upstairs and, and Asian folks are, you know, pushing boxes down the street. So there was a lot of like visual paralleling, you know, while not equivalency, like we do have, there are examples of Asian Americans being, um, you know, experiencing police violence. And so I think part of part of us, you know, you know we're also translating the film into Chinese um, for our broadcast. And so when it gets to that audience, I think it's gonna be really important. Some of the really basic things are gonna be very important. These are gonna be folks that haven't had like a film, um, you know, have are not able to walk up on the streets to three black men and like talk to them. And you know, because we had a team that felt comfortable doing that, we're able to show that to folks. And and one of the things we wanted to do in making the film too was like sort of take the temperature down a little bit and take the volume down a little bit so that people weren't so you know I know that I know that Cyrus was hot today, but like you know some folks could watch it. Like a, it was not as hot. You know, if we could take some of the conversations down uh, outside of the level that they were you know yelling at each other in the street, then there might be more opportunity for people to listen to each other. So we were hoping that we could open people's minds up to listening to those perspectives. And, you know, this is, um, this is like really difficult work and it's not, um, it's not stuff that's, that the film is gonna change, but if we can sort of begin to shift people's like points of view, then, um, you know, slightly, we thought that that's one of the things that um, we could, we could uh, move towards with the film. And I guess to uh, maybe to address the the question um, a little bit is that um, we weren't trying to be um, neutral per se. I think we were in the end, and I, I don't want to speak for for the other two, but I think certainly Ursula's idea, which we executed, was to say um, the real issue here is um, institutional racism is um, white supremacy, is um, this idea that you can have this abstracted institution of which the members can't individually be held accountable because then where does accountability go? And like if Peter isn't, can't be held accountable because it's the NYPD as an institution that is unassailable, then where does accountability go? Um, so our I think our editorial stance was to say, um, there's something wrong with the system and we need to look at that and we need to unite as communities who are under the system to change it. So, um, I mean, yeah. Um, Michelle, did you want to jump in? I don't want to cut you off if you do. Uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll just uh, piggyback on that. Um, you know, from my perspective, I felt like I could like completely understand really both sides and really empathize with both sides. Um, and also take issue with both sides, you know, in various ways. And um, I think our stance was just to try 
to you know present both sides um, and not kind of try to like align with either side, but um, you know, what am I trying to say? Just to be able to empathize with both sides, um, whether you disagree with them or not, if you really feel like where they're coming from, then you can at least, you know, um, understand a little bit. And that if there's like a perspective at all, in a way it's, it's that it was just absurd and sad that they ended up fighting against each other and pitted against each other. It was just like so unfortunate that that's, you know, what this case like led to. So I think, you know, and then I think the film does nod in the end to like coalition building, even though that's not an explicit, you know, um, point of view. But I think at the end, there's a sort of like, you know, like a montage that kind of, you know, it's like editorial, you know, it's, it's the kind of the moment where the film editorializes a little bit to say like, this is where the answer, you know, Love kind of when is. when you say exactly what I was gonna say and I was gonna ask about the montage. So maybe you guys can talk a little bit more about that montage because um, yeah, we see, who do we see in that montage? I, I, I saw Grace Lee Boggs, but tell, tell, talk to us, talk us through how, how that montage came to be. Well, that's that's the A plus viewer that sees those specific faces in there. Um, folks like you are going to know who a lot of those um, pictures represent. We, you know, at the point that we were trying to create that ending, it was uh, the the visual tool was something that Jason came up with, and um, and we thought a lot about what the content would be, um, and and it was like you know at first we we really needed we needed the film was like really packed with a lot of complexity and ideas and just like jammed full of footage at some point so we needed sort of these breathing moments and we needed we knew that audiences were going to be feeling stuff and needed some breathers and so that there were going to be a lot of audiences that just needed like something flashing like a subway car that that could just like you know give them a little bit of a space but we knew that some folks like you would see what was in those in those images because some of them are pretty iconic. And so yes, there are there are basically images of folks. Um, we, we were hoping to you know get as many as we could of like Black and Asian solidarity moments. Um, but there are also like other moments of solidarity. So basically, it was our solidarity montage. And um, you know, there's Yuri Kochiyama, and there's uh, civil rights stuff in there. There's um, you know Muslim ban stuff. Uh, there's post. Um, uh, Charlottesville stuff in there. Um, so, I mean, you know, and as we were like picking through those photos, it was even difficult because we would, we would start to research all the mo movements and realize that some of those, like, um, some of those things that have, you know, that visually represent moments of solidarity in the past also had like a lot of complicated, um, backdrops. So it was like, you know, some of these, some of these things, you know, some things we ended up taking out, but it's, you know, there were, you know, I, like I'm thinking of one in particular who, you know, like was a was, you know, this person ended up being an informant, and and but there was like a, it was like a, a solidarity building um, history there. So I mean, it was just it. I think we also understood that that these weren't like examples of like utopian solidarity moments either. That they were all like hard fought and complicated and messy things, and that that's the process of us um, coming together, and it's going to be the process. So I think. I think in some ways, like to those folks who are gonna like look at those images one by one or study them in class or have like a backdrop in that in that kind of history, um, it's something to think about. Um, and, you know, both look to an example and as warning signs. Okay, one more question from the audience. Um, so I'm, this one says, I'm interested in the earlier point of trying to, to strike an emotional and contextual balance in the film as opposed to something more quantitative how did the mixed crew collaborate and utilize their own perspectives to achieve this? Jason or Michelle, you want to take that? Oh, from the edit, from the ed editorial perspective. Yeah. I, I mean, um, uh, I, I'll speak from, um, from the black perspective that, um, what what I was searching for in the in the footage and some of the sequences um, was, um, of course, to to as as best I could empathize with and clearly communicate the Asian American side. But what I felt honestly more intimate with was the black side and characters like Hortensia, who's who is in, in some ways a difficult character in in the in the in the raw footage itself. Um, uh, making sure that she felt like a fully realized human being on the screen. Um, and 
uh, as well as Akai, we had a lot of conversations around um, like with Peter, we had this kind of great archive. We have him as a, you know, as an elementary school kid and, you know, as a, as a, we can see him as a child and he's got this kind of baby face. Um, but one point Ursula brought up was that we don't want to kind of um, uh, infantilize the, them because um, they are adults. Um, and Ursula made a great point when I was trying to figure out coverage for um, expressing Peter's backstory was that like if we have childhood photos of, of Peter, then we got to have um, um, something similar for Akai or something that, that does the same thing. Um, so that we're we're not kind of telling the audience uh, uh, to look at Peter as a child, but look at Akai as like an adult, um, which I thought was was really an intelligent move on Ursula's part. Um, but having, I, I think, I mean, obviously Michelle being Asian and my being black, I think absolutely uh, influenced how we both looked at the film and were able to sort of provide um, both sides. And you know, kudos to Ursula for for thinking to do that in the first place, um, and for I, I'm not I don't think it's been mentioned yet in in, in this Q and A um, that I mean, there there are basically no white voices in the film. It's just the black and Asian communities talking. That's even in the news archive, uh, the news reporters, um, and I think that's actually um, that that's actually important for this film because it allows the conversation to happen almost totally inside the community, um, to communities which don't often enough interact. I would say so. Um, yeah, from my perspective, that's that's how uh, how the, the ethnicity of the of the crew um, affected the film. I'd say in real in very real ways it affected it. Michelle, did you want to jump in? Go ahead. Sure. Um, so I, I'm Chinese American. Um, so, you know, obviously bring that perspective to it. Um, but, you know, my my position is very particular. And I think part of what's in the film even is, is always to remember that any community is not monolithic. Um, and, you know, Asian American is certainly not a monolithic community. Chinese Americans are not a monolithic community. Even Chinese Americans in New York City is not a monolithic community. And in the film, you know, we have like sort of the, some of the main organizers are like from Brooklyn Chinatown or some, and there are a lot of, Im, you know, immigrant populations, but then there's sort of like American born, you know, tough guy Chinatown characters. Then we have these like, or second generation activists on the Akai side. And so there's just a lot of diversity, you know, within that um, community too. But if we're, you know, talking about kind of the main, you know, if, if I'm gonna generalize a little bit about like the uh, Peter Liang side, you know, protesters um, that were more, it seemed to me like more immigrant um, Chinese Americans. Um, you know, my parents are immigrants and so I can kind of follow, I mean, they've been here for 60 years, so they're not quite like recent immigrants, but um, you know, my dad was following the, the case in Chinese newspapers and on WeChat in the same way that these uh, protesters would have been. Um, and, you know, I think he probably, you know, was supporting Peter Liang. And so even though he's been here a long time, like they just don't have the same, you know, they just don't have that consciousness um, of, of these kind of issues. And that's part of the journey of, you know, Asian Americans um, and where they need to go. Um, but I think just to understand you know, why I could understand the Asian perspective, even though I didn't, you know, I might not agree with the Peter Liang supporters um, or even be wincing at some of the ways in which they, you know, supported him. I get that idea of, um, you know, that, you know, this, they're coming here because they love the system and they wanna, you know, they, they wanna be a part of the system and succeed in the system. And they've come from a different system that was, you know, in many ways um, worse than this one, you know, from a, a sort of, so for them relative to that, they're, they're absolutely not for dismantling the system. That's why it's so foreign to them to like try and engage with this other dialogue about, you know, breaking down the system. For them, it's just, you know, it's like both sides want equity, but they want different kinds of, there's just seeing it in different ways. Like, are you gonna get equity by, getting fair treatment within this system. And that's sort of what the Chinese Americans are like asking for. 
like we're, you know, we just all want to be treated the same as everyone else and like work hard and get whatever the same benefits as everybody. Or are you going to say, you know, you can't get fair treatment within the system because it's not a fair system. So you have to dismantle the system. And like, that's, I think where the, like the central, you know, conflict between the communities is. And I think, you know, for an immigrant community, as you get through the generations and stuff, you start to, you're able to open your eyes more to like these systemic things. But I think it's really hard when you're just like an immigrant community really absorbed in your own, you know, whatever day-to-day -day, like survival and, and in, in this country to kind of have these more, you know, bigger picture nuanced um, ideas about like systemic racism. But I just turn, you know, I just turn back to that beautiful poster that you showed for the Justice for Edmund U rally and vigil, right? So that's 20 years ago. So that's not in this current moment of discussing defund or discussing abolition. And that was a cross coalition, cross community, super political. The poster said, if you can put the poster up again, I don't know if you can, but it says end racist policing right like it was it was like absolutely uh challenging the state like this was a a, a moment of activism that challenged so i think that there have been some incredible uh, examples uh, uh you know coming from within chinatown in takaranto of people rising up and saying you know from the very communities that we're discussing here saying actually no no this system is uh is not actually and so anyways I, and the other thing i would just say you know that's so challenging i think about the whole story um that we're having that we're discussing tonight right is that for black and indigenous people on turtle island the police were the entire function of their system was created to 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 attempt to Gen to, to, uh, as an attempted genocide of indigenous people and in, and to ensure black people remained enslaved on slave labor camps. That was the entire reason why the RCMP was created was to bring us back to slave labor camps and to clear the land of indigenous people. So when we talk about like, you know, can we just try to get along in this system? What it sounds like or what it can feel like is, can we just get along in this system that is okay with the brutalization of black and indigenous communities as long as we're gonna be okay, right? And I think that that is one of the things that is really hard to hear. And that is one of the things that I think has made for a lot of, um, I think a lot of uh, the, the, the challenges that you see in that film, right? Like this is this tension that the ways that our communities have been pitted against each other, you know, by white supremacy in order to you know have some of us believe that if we just go along we're going to be okay and if we just turn away from the ways that our brethren are being brutalized we're going to be okay so white supremacy has done a good job of that but i just turn back to that poster from edmund you and i think okay that was 20 years ago we can do this we've done this before Surely in the moment of swirling heightened activism of 2015, 2016, which was way more dramatic than anything that was happening in 1999 and 2000 around it, targeted policing, around anti-blackness, we couldn't even talk about anti, uh, you know, so it, it's just so interesting that we were able to come together then. And I just wonder what what is happening with the rampant upswing of white supremacy now that has made it such a huge gulf for us to be able to come together and organize? I mean, one thing that I wanted to say is that a lot of these people weren't even in the States 20 years ago. So we're talking about like Asian Americans uh, are the largest or the fastest growing demographic in the US. In New York City, they're also, I think at the time of this case, they were also the, the, the group with the highest level of poverty and people don't, there are a lot of things that people misunderstand because of the way data is used by people who are interested in maintaining white supremacy. Um, that So the community feels very un misunderstood. And one other thing that I wanted to mention about the context of this film and we weren't really able to include it is that this is also happening in America at a time when there was a lot of um, 
disinformation being sown by like foreign governments. And so, so a lot, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have like, we didn't have Russia like fanning race wars. And that is, you know, beyond like the bad actors in America that are trying to keep those things apart with power. Like a lot of, a lot of the like social media bubbles that people were experiencing in that time were also influenced by outside actors that had, you know, like international bad, bad, uh, you know, uh, intentions. So um, it's not to not to take away any hope from what you were saying. Like I think that a lot of those, you know, those examples of like coalition building, we have to like keep looking at those. And I, I was super excited to see the two of you bring up all these examples of, of uh, Canadian, um, you know, uh, moments of time that that really mirror what's happening here. Because you know, we, there's so much happening in the U.S. that we're not even tracking what's going on in Canada. But to know that all this stuff is happening. That these things are happening cross borders um, makes it even more the, the imperative even um, greater. And you know, one thing that we weren't able to add into the foot into the film because we lacked a tiny bit of footage was that this um, when this Peter Liang support um, you know poured out into the streets, it was also in Canada. And so for us, that was like a very uh, it, it was kind of crazy because we're you know it's it's one thing to have people protesting in New York City where the laws here directly affect the citizens here. And it's another thing to have people in you know. Ohio or you know LA protesting is another thing to have people in Calgary and Toronto and Montreal protesting. Um, so you know it's it's, re it's really important that we're showing this film here and we're having this uh, discussion here and that the, your voices are being elevated in this conversation because um, it's one that needs to be had in a lot of places. Um, so I think we have about four minutes left. There's a few questions here that kind of follow from some of the things that we've been talking about. So I'm going to read three of them, and then maybe you can speak to what comes in the time, and then we'll wrap it for this session. But I think there's still much, much more to talk about um, that comes out of this document that you've created. Um, so first question, do you think that your film challenges internalized racism in the Asian community against the Black community? Um, another question. Why do you think the Chinese community, in spite of the language barrier and apparent busy lifestyle, decided uh, to rally behind this case and present themselves as a visible and collective political um, figure? And um, last question, were, were there conversations in the editing room to address anti-Blackness in the Chinese and Asian American community? Jason, do you want to go on that one? Which one? The last sure. one? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll try to be short. Yes, um, we definitely had conversations around that. I mean, some some more sinister than others. For example, um, there were some just like really practical things that like um, Ursula was, I think, smartly pointing out that like for some of the black characters who might like look alike uh, to to a non-black viewer, like we had to be careful to make sure to ID people so that when somebody came back, we would uh, uh, an Asian viewer might recognize um, might have a hard time recognizing a black person um, if, if black people all look alike to a certain community, and that kind of it cuts both ways. And some of these are stereotypes, and some of them are sort of culturally culturally indoctrinated. But um, so, so there are some just sort of practical, but uh, that, that sort of lends to that question. Um, and then, I mean, I, I would say that there was, uh, there was, there were things that we cut out where we could have pushed it more one way or another. Um, for example, the, the, uh, the uh, former police officer um, who, who was very um, conservative, um, there were sort of coded words that he'd used to say that there are criminal elements in the city when talking about the black community, or you could read it as he was talking, that he was talking about the black community. Um, in an effort to keep the answer short so we can get to the other questions, I'll leave it there. But the, the, yeah, in short, yes, we absolutely did have conversations around uh, around that um, uh, and, and vice versa too. Um, yeah. Arsula, maybe a final word from you? Yeah, I mean, that was a delicate dance. And in general, we our position was to like show rather than tell. And so the idea was not really to like confront audiences, um, but to like really show what was happening. And we did not, you know, what we captured is what we captured. And, and you know, you can see like a scene also where, um, you know, I mean, I think the Asian community is very sensitive about being uh, labeled as anti-black although i think that i think there are a lot of things that people are not understanding or so like 
uh, you know, so like in the body after living in an American society for so long that really, um, it really adds to sort of the prejudicial attitudes. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're in a moment right now where there's like so much anti-Asian violence and it's very hard for people to sort of be hit over the head with, um, you need to undo this while they're still personally confronting like violence against their own community. Um, so I guess that's a terrible answer, but um, yeah, we definitely talked about it a lot and we only had, you know, we weren't gonna like put up a card that said this, that or the other. We had a few examples that we thought were very, we should be very clear to audiences, but also, um, you know, I think audiences will interpret them a little bit differently. Um, yeah, sorry. No. I think the I think the the viewer is asking for more. It sounds like the viewer is asking for more, and in some ways that people are, um, you know, I think that in some ways we couldn't offer everything in the film. I mean, we definitely, you know, Michelle and I started on the film together, and we had an early collaborator who was like making sure that we would go, you know, making sure that we would go hard on the Asian community. And uh, little did she know that Michelle and I are the types of people that will go hardest on our own people in some ways. Um, so we were not like pulling any punches and we were not like deleting things that happened. Um, but we also wanted to make sure they were fair and that they um, were rep you know, representative. And, and um, anyway, I, I think I'm dancing around a really bad, a bad answer to the question. But you know, I'm glad that I'm, every single time we screen the film, someone asks a question like that. And so I think there inherently is something in the film that, um, that bubbles up that conversation. And that's basically what we wanted to do. We wanted to like drive conversations um, about a lot of these different topics. And I'm really excited to hear all the things that people want to talk about after the film. Thank you, Ursula, Jason, Michelle, and Cyrus for being here, for taking the time to talk through this. Um, thanks to the folks at home, keep talking about it. Please invite other folks to, to check, um, check it out and to check out this conversation. Um, I want to hand it over back to Aram. Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guests, Ursula, Jason, Michelle, and Cyrus for this vital discussion. And thank you to Natalia for moderating this talk. I'd also like to thank Anissa and Jamie, our ASL interpreters. Tonight was the first night of Relation, and our festival runs until November 19th, which means there's another week of films, panels, and more discussions. So please join us online at relation.com. And take care and stay safe.